Hello and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 411 that's 411 of the Agassino Zynga show with me your host Agassino Zynga how you doing how you feeling great amazing how am I you know same old same old trying to make sure I'm filling myself up with liquids keeping myself hydrated and all of that good stuff if it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe and of course leave me a comment down below on your thoughts and opinions I'd love to get them and if you're listening via the podcast app a five-star review download the show and share it will go a long way to help it spread and of course support via patrons always always more than welcome I do a patron show bonus show for only my patron subscribers that you can find on patreon that's patreon.com for us agostino that's patreon.com for us a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o for as little as one dollar per month you get access to that bonus show and only on that bonus show so i think it's equivalent of one dollar which is the equivalent of like no one pound something the equivalent of like one dollar so definitely make sure you check that out at patreon.com for us agostino that's patreon.com for us a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o do not delay get on that today yeah so here we are another week um another week another week another week we're back back into the grind what's been happening in the uk we've obviously got news about the new lockdown tier that we're here in london specifically we got stuff to do with united some pogba stuff some other stuff some scene things another update on daniel wang and peggy goo it just keeps rumbling on and on and on and so many many more other bits and pieces so grab yourself a little drink a something to munch um whatever it may be sit back relax and let's get in to the show first things first i've been reading over the weekend so i've been reading this the secret dj by the secret dj book number one right um i'm still waiting for book number two i actually ordered book number two on pre-order but it's now gonna what arrive in january sometime which is annoying so then i thought rags let me get book number two book number one sorry and just read that before book number two comes and judging by the date it's going to arrive in january i'll probably be able to finish this by the time it arrives but anyway regardless most of you are aware of the secret dj i am just mostly because of little extracts i think maybe taken from the book or other articles that were written and posted on i think mixmag it wasn't dj Mag, but one of those sites they posted little excerpts or a little kind of articles about you know how to conduct yourself the nightlife like just really cool stuff that you kind of would only get from somebody that has a lot of experience in the scene i think whoever's behind it has got like 25 plus years experience you know uh being a professional dj or working within dance music or in the scene in general and it's um so far again i've only got you know a quarter of the way through i'm just gonna try and probably finish it by the end of the week but it's a really good read right really really good read um i love how it just starts off straight away kind of giving you an overview of a day in the life of a dj like what kind of goes on thoughts and feelings um how you know um how this all affects your overall gig in different locations and the many different you know characters you meet along the way and it got me thinking about the whole Daniel Wang and Peggy Goo situation um about why exactly what it, yeah that's what it got me thinking it got me thinking about the Danny Wang aspect of it right because Danny Wang for the most part everyone's sort of surprised by his um outburst against Peggy because he generally seems like a fairly sensible guy he t- speaks quite knowledgeably about the scene he's very well respected um of course you know um he's a great artist in his own right um a pretty decent DJ too so it's just odd to hear somebody who has that level of notoriety that level of um you know relevance in a scene who's kind of you know got his own sort of uh niche that he sort of occupies to be offended and to be upset or bent or the nose put out of shape because of Peggy. You would maybe expect it more from somebody that's within her scene who's been working maybe longer than her. Who kind of kind of be like, hey, that's unfair. How come she's getting that spot and I'm not, right? But you don't really think they exist in the same world. And then it also got me thinking a little bit about Playgraves, right? About um why there seems to be uh no shortage of really really high level djs playing playgraves i think for the most part we could all understand if your local hero somebody that you know that plays in you know uh in your town in your city um who's really good and decides to put on a playgrave or decides to go play somewhere at a playgrave because for the most part you would imagine they don't really earn as much as a professional dj and they still sort of like working their way up the ladder 
So in order to kind of, you know, make sure they keep the roof over their head and put a meal on the table, you can kind of rationalize why they'd want to take the risk of, you know, maybe, you know, infecting numerous people with COVID or whatever it may be and spreading the virus and just causing some unto do harm. Because um, I think most of the harm with the plague graves doesn't necessarily come from the cases because you would imagine, you know, it depends on how you believe it. If you believe that COVID is what's that thing called um if it's if the transmission rate is really high if you believe that um depends there's different bits of science out there that saying the transmission level isn't as high as people think it is you just get sick or you don't um but regardless right um most of the i think damage that comes from play graves comes from just the optics of it because i don't think it helps for collective adherence when you're seeing other people that live in the same city that you are in partying and having fun it doesn't necessarily um it doesn't necessarily help you to obey the rules or the new restrictions or to abide by whatever it may be right? it just makes it difficult and when that makes it difficult so it sows you know a seed of doubt a, a seed of um um, yeah, just seed of doubts, and then you add conspiracies on top of it, and it just gets all crazy in it. So they don't really, they don't really justify an ends, and it, and they probably make things worse in general, right? Whether from a health and from a societal point of view. But then it also got me. I was also kind of always wondering from the beginning of you know the play graves, like why is it that all these really big people that are like you know the top ten, top twenty DJs voted in the world who play like crazy places and fly around in private jets and generally you would imagine just from looking from the outside looking in, especially because people in the dance music scene are super gossipy and everyone talks about money and who does what and who's a who's a who's a cane and who's not. You definitely get an idea about what people kind of make in terms of gigs that they play. So if you're kind of thinking, okay, this person X Y Z person makes like between anywhere between five thousand to thirty thousand per gig, right? And they've been playing or they've been DJing professionally at that level for like fifteen years, it would you would be within your right to be like, hmm, why are they playing in the playgrave somewhere in the middle of a desert where people have to stand in hula hoops? when they've clearly got the money to survive a, a year, right? You'd think that at the most, right? Especially including the productions and the streams they're doing. It just doesn't make any sense. Then I read this, you know, the first chapter or two of The Secret DJ and it all made sense to me. There is something very addictive. It feels like being a superstar DJ, being a pro DJ. Like the, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with the playing. It's everything around it. The lifestyle of going to an airport, catching a flight, sitting in business class, maybe getting a private jet. The ritual of what you do when you're on that plane, when you get off the plane, meeting your contact at the venue, going to the hotel, preparing yourself, what you do at the hotel before you get there, get into the venue itself, um, you know, um, talking to the DJ that's playing before you, communicating with the, you know, his entourage happens being a DJ booth. Maybe you're getting vibed out by them, you know, in, indulging yourself on your in your rider. Whatever it may be, it seems like, especially the first chapter or two where he sort of like speaks, he sort of breaks down the entire day of playing an international gig. I think it might have been in Ibiza, if I remember correctly. And he sort of documents it from like, I'm going to say 5 p.m., the day before the night before basically in london flying out to ibiza and what happens and it's essentially this whole section here right that i'm showing in the screen and it definitely it opened my eyes up to thinking oh these guys aren't playing because they need the money which you know the money i guess is a great bonus because i'm sure a lot of people playing these playgrounds are probably playing for a reduced fee because you know i i, I don't want to assume Right, you you'd think you'd assume that it would be a reduced fee, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were getting the same amount because they, they can just command it. It is what it is. The game is the game. It wouldn't surprise me. Some of the super agents, you know, the people that are signed like WME and CAA, they're just saying, "Hey, fuck you, pay me. If you don't want to pay the fee, you're not going to get the person." But it definitely opened my eyes up to think, you know what? These playgraves are DJs are definitely playing because they're just addicted in the same way that we are as punters to the feeling of like just going out because i think a lot of us i think i can speak for myself in that regard yeah it's great to see people play i think in london we're quite spoiled that way in major most major markets major cities you are spoiled in terms of lineups and where you can go but for the most part it's less really about the person you're going to see because you know generally most nights are going to be like a five to a six out five upwards out of ten right you're never going to really going to get a real two out of ten event it's very rare that happens um promoters aren't going to risk their reputation to throw a, that kind of event because they know you just won't come back because there's loads of options that you can go to but most of the reason why you're going is because of the whole thing in it it's the whole vibe right um you know it, it's the 
it's the pre thing it's the meeting up with your friends it's the tra it's the jokes on the train before there it's the queuing up it's the toilet shit it's the conversation you have in a smoky room those are the same those are the things you sort of look forward to so i'd imagine on the dj side of things that's the thing that they look forward to as well right because you know imagine if you're a big dj you're probably playing you know especially during festival season or you know or when a busy peak season you're playing loads of different markets at the same time back to back to back there's not really much time to really sort through your music so you're probably playing the same set recycled a few times here or there maybe with addition of a couple of tunes so the music isn't really that exciting it is don't get me wrong but it doesn't really put the kick doesn't really f uh, light a fire up there as, as it should so part of the thing that you're actually looking forward to is maybe bumping into your peers at the airport um seeing a manager or an agent or a booker or whatever that you like right uh linking up with a dealer that happens to be your friend now uh whatever it may be those are the things that you actually enjoy and you get addicted to and it's quite hard to break that addiction especially even more so during a global pandemic when legitimately you have no other use right because what else are DJs going to do now what else can they do legitimately they could maybe teach courses online they could maybe i don't know listen to people's demos that's about it right they have no use to society or to themselves probably um you know the they don't feel useful unless they're behind a deck playing somewhere so that maybe is part of it why are they doing it because again i'm just thinking about it the other day i was like hold on need, again not watching anyone's pockets but nina Kravitz just got a massive gig right doing the whole cyberpunk thing probably got paid a pretty penny to make that work and loads of other events in italy in the middle of the summer like why is she still playing these weird events in the middle of the uae but then it makes sense so again monetarily i'm sure those events are gonna you know pay for two or three years of inactivity and also it's just addictive isn't it they just can't get enough they just don't want to be at home staring at their shadow they'd rather be in an airport somewhere waiting for a flight and um, waiting for someone to pick them up at an airport to go to the hotel all these things are essentially part of their identity and they can't let that go or switch it over it just is what it is so that might be a reason to explain it but regardless um i really do think you should check out the book I, again the, the book number two i don't think is out at the moment um i'm sorry it's not in stock it's out but it's not in stock from from what i checked on amazon recently again i pre-ordered mine maybe the beginning of december maybe the end of november and it, it was due to come out it was due to come out is due to deliver on about the 12th of december and it never did because it was out of stock so i guess i must have been one of the last people to put pre-order in and other people got prioritized so now i'm going to get it on sometime in the end of january but still check check out the first one anyway for the time being it's a great great book um loads of great little anecdotes and stories in there maybe give you another understanding or another perspective of what's going on um again it's, i don't think it's going to make you have sympathy for these people playing in places and getting paid you know 15 grand to play during the pandemic i'm not sure it's going to do that but it's just going to maybe give you a perspective on what's going on and why these really big people are going out and essentially putting loads of people at risk just so they can kind of like soothe their ego to some point right so definitely check it out the secret dj book one but i just think it's called secret dj just the yellow one anyway um that's it for that one what else we got to talk about here what else we got to talk about here oh okay so um we also have to say r.i.p to john lee carr espionage writer who unfortunately passed away at 89 years old the other day um i think most of you will be familiar with him for writing the original tinker well writing a novel for what the movie tinker Taylor spy was based on um so this is from bbc news it says here british espionage writer john lee carr has died at age 89 following a short illness his literary agents have said the author of the spy who came in from the cold war and tinker taylor soldier spy died from pneumonia on saturday fellow authors paid tribute with stephen king calling him a literary giant and a humanitarian spirit um historical fiction writer robert harris said lee carr who chronicled the world of the cold war spies was one of the great post-war british novelists i definitely agree with that one Booker Prize winner Margaret Atwood, um, she said, tweeted that his novels, um, Spy Master, and she said, no, she tweeted that his novels featuring uh, Spy Master George Smiley, described by Lee Carr as an antidote for the James Bond, were the key to understanding the mid 20th century. Historian and novelist Simon C. Bag Monty, Mon Monty for, well, he's got some great people um, paying tribute to him in it. Um, described Lee Carr as a titan of English literature and said he was heartbroken. Um, duh, 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 Mr. Gallo said, Mr. Gallo, who represented the novelist, whose real name was David Cornwall, has was for almost 15 years and said his loss will be felt for by every book lover. If everyone interested in the human condition, we have lost a great figure in English literature, a great, um, a man with great wit, kindness, humor, and 
a humor and intelligence. I have lost a friend, mentor, and inspiration. I've made it a flipping. I've made it one of my little goals to actually read um, a lot of kind of uh, his books, especially the original Tinker Tailor Spy, because I watched that again recently. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal movie. I think it's available still now on Amazon Prime uh, video platform, which is you know it's a bit terrible to use, but it does work. And I was gonna read it because I supposedly the book is better than the movie, and the movie is pretty good, right? It's like The Martian. The Martian movie, I think adaptation of the book is actually stellar, but the book is even better. Like it's just you know they go hand in hand. I think Harry Potter is the same sort of thing as well. A lot of people say the Harry Potter films are quite um, you know. Uh, have have can hold a candle to the books themselves so definitely i think i'm gonna pay tribute to him i remember you know his um prestigious writing ability and ability to basically churn out book after book after book after book of high quality especially in the espionage um you know era and genre so yeah r.i.p john lee carr um gone but not forgotten and again that's a great thing about being a a writer in it right it, you, sort of like similar to like an architect your legacy basically lives on you know way 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 especially more so with literature because your legacy lasts for way way longer right it just you think of all the stories that got passed down to us from like i'm gonna say is it the pre-roman days where they used to look basically repeat stories right they just basically orally tell them to each other and you just memorize them generation after generation or pass them down before they could actually write them anywhere to keep copies um, so those stories are like what thousands and thousands of years old some of them that we're still sort of um, reiterating now and twisting and sort of adapting into our own modern era so just imagine what books do right and how many people they inspire um, and the imagination too because that's the thing as well it's awesome about books whenever you read especially novels there's usually they're usually a lot richer because you have to make the images up in your head as you're reading them right you're kind of picturing what is actually is going on based by the you know the colors and the tones and the textures the writer is basically using with words but you're still having to interpret it through your own prism so you so even like we all have a different memory of what a book means to us based on how we basically read it at the time that we're reading it obviously the main story holds tight but um, I think that's a real power of books in that regard. Uh, it's very visceral and there's no forgetting it. You know, nowadays you watch a movie, you just have no idea what you just watched, what the plot was, who was in it, right? It just, it's a gone by in a blip. Maybe that's because of the bingeification of society and like, everything's a binge watch. We don't really sit down and enjoy things as we probably should do or as we did maybe in the past. But regardless, anyway, um, RIP John Lee Carr, gone but not forgotten. Definitely going to check out more of his books and of course, provide a review as I go along next on the list we have an update via man united regarding the extremely frustrating paul pogba situation which keeps on rumbling on and on and on and on some interesting developments right so i guess most of you are aware that just after we beat west ham we came back from one nil down to beat them three two paul pogba scored a pretty decent goal maybe more than a decent goal from about 30 yards 35 yards out i'd say side foot um bender you know it, it, it effectively hit the inside netting it was that good right such a good shot and basically showed us what he can do when he's playing to the levels that he can play and given a freedom to obviously express himself blah 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 soon after Mino Raiola his superstar or his super agent who kind of represents some of the brightest uh, talent that exists out in world football decided to come out and essentially um declared that Paul Pogba had to leave the club you know we weren't going anywhere um he's not gonna stay and just you know essentially kicked the hornet's nest and just kicked up a whole lot of fuss on social and just you know essentially got my United fans all around the country around the world completely frustrated and angry at the situation and for the most part Paul Pogba didn't come out and refute the claims he short stayed silence which you know basically told us that hey that story is basically true you know usually silence is a confirmation nowadays which I can definitely attest to and the fact that Paul Popper did tell us a few months back or maybe was it a month, few months back or a year back when we were in China or something and he had that interview for the editors I think he was doing some editors promotion and he was asked about his future and he said yeah I want a new challenge I want to go somewhere else so he's told us quite categorically he wants to move um, and he sees himself going somewhere else to compete for titles or whatever maybe who cares he wants to go but the club have obviously 
decided that they don't want to let him go if they do they're going to have to get a world record fee for him that's what basically you're seeing because i think we could all agree that our transfer activity has been pretty diabolical and i think man united along with ed woodward have been embarrassed numerous times in the transfer market um you know i just look at the affair that happened with who was it recently with Harry Maguire, I think it might have been. Was it Harry Maguire where we kind of tried to haggle the price down, but eventually end up paying whatever they wanted to pay anyway? Maybe it was Lukaku. I forgot who it was, but definitely somebody. We're not really good at transfers. So it seems like the club are going out of their way during this cultural reset to make sure that we sell our players for what exactly what they're worth and not a penny more and not a penny less. So Pogba, unfortunately, was priced out. I think of a few moves. I think there was a Barcelona offer that came through that was derogatory prior as well during that time. So he's essentially been told to, hey, unless you get an offer for you, you're going to see out your contract at his club. And then, of course, as we do in all our contracts, I think we installed this sort of like one year it automatically one year trigger extension when you come towards the end of your two years i think of it i'm not sure what it is how it works out but there's an extension that you automatically get so that means that he's got basically another 18 months at the club um or he walks for free which is then putting more pressure on united to sell him so all in all just a whole sit server situation um and from what I've seen online of what I've kind of read on listened to on podcast it seems that behind the scene Pope is like obviously somewhat tapped out right he somewhat decided that hey my future definitely lies outside of United and it's definitely started to affect his training it's definitely started to affect his application and it's definitely started to affect his overall demeanor around the club people have said he sort of changed he sort of slump in his shoulders and definitely looks like a player the, the classic signs of a player that kind of wants to leave um uh, and you know his reasons for leaving are you know are whatever his reasons are but the interesting part of it I think is someone said that I think it might have been on the Duncan Castles podcast, a transfer window, a really good one, right? He said that he's heard from somebody or somebody's interpreted the situation as when Pogba came back, he never actually wanted to come back to United. He actually wanted to go to Barcelona or Real Madrid or one of those clubs, right? So United was sort of like his fourth option. He wanted to either have a contract extension at Juve, either go to one of the big two Spanish sides. Um, Man City, I guess, was the third option and then to come United. When the Juve contract extension didn't happen because I think they needed the money, so they accepted the public bid. And of course, Real Madrid and Barcelona at the time didn't want to pay whatever Man United paid, and Man City the same, right? So that only left him with one option, and he had to. And then you know, Juventus accepted our bid because it was the best bid they were going to get in that window. And he decided, hey, why not? Let's go back and see what I can do and prove them wrong. But there was always a bit of ill feeling in Pogba's heart because he felt that he was done wrong by the club in general when he first left. Because if you remember back then, that was when Alex Ferguson was refusing to play him because he wouldn't sign a new contract. But he went, he wouldn't sign a new contract until he got more playing time. So we kind of left in a sort of like stalemate. And then Alex Ferguson kept playing people like Raphael and Jusan Park in the centre midfield, right? And I can imagine like, me as well, because I remember I was, I was following the youth team a lot during that time and I was watching Pogba play for the reserves. And I just thought, this guy is like a like he's a beast he's so good right um so effortless so uh, majestic on the ball left foot right foot can play he was a little bit he was much more dynamic when he was younger i think maybe when he's got older he sort of kind of rested into his sort of preferred position of maybe playing a little bit more in a bit more of a luxurious role he doesn't have a many commitments he did in the past but when i remember him playing for the reserves or playing for you know the under whatever they may be he was a lot more dynamic he used to cover every blade of grass get in the tackle um of course tenacity just just he was great to watch especially in youth team games right imagine seeing what a young imagine imagine what it must be like seeing a young paul pogba strutting his stuff in the youth leagues so the feeling is that he kind of obviously um you know has a lot of has a lot of love for the club and he really took it personally when Sir Alex Ferguson basically made him surplus the requirements and picked the likes of Jason Park and Rafa ahead of him because he wouldn't sign a new contract and it never really it was kind of a it was always a bit of a little bad taste in his mouth so when he came back he came back with some hesitation but he went to kind of like you know set the record straight and then of course it hasn't really worked out as he would have hoped especially with under the current ownership and it seems like it never will work out with the current ownership, especially with the coach we have in the place now at the moment, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who's definitely um, not at the level that we need to get back to where we want to be. If we want to be a top four club, you keep Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, right? He's, gonna, he's basically proven that he can do that. If you want to win the league and you want to potentially, you know, challenge for the Champions League, he's not the guy. He's proven that as well. We got locked out. You know, we haven't won the league since he's been here. It is what it is. But 
Pogba's obviously had, you know, is feeling, he's doubting what's going on. But it's interesting to see now that Mina Morello's come out and essentially backtracked, not backtracked, he's been squirming a little bit regarding the comments. And this, again, might corroborate some of the stories we hear about Pogba on the Transfer Window podcast. And this is the screenshot here from, or just the actual tweet here from uh, United Zone uh, regarding Mina Morello quoted as saying the following, Mina Morello about Pogba. He says... I was talking about next summer, so when you've made that first comment, it's very difficult to see big clubs making these kinds of transfers in January. We will see what happens next summer. So obviously he's saying that because I guess maybe his client's upset with him or because he's, you know, responding to the backlash. But regardless, it's interesting to see him somewhat backtrack on his original comment. And I think it's also interesting because we've now got a, a kind of insight into what the real issue is for Pogba is that he doesn't really have anywhere to go. This reminds me a little bit similar to the, Lionel Messi uh, situation. Lionel Messi sort of declared he went to leave Barcelona because of the ownership and because of the direction of the club. He wants to have a new challenge um, core. But then he was put in a position by the club where they essentially backed him into a corner and said, unless you go and strike, we are not going to let you go for unless we, you know, we uh, we get an offer in for this amount because I think he's meant to leave in a free, but there was some complication with his contract and they found a loophole, which essentially meant if he went to leave Barcelona, they had to get a bid above 500 million, which obviously is ridiculous, right? No one's going to pay that in this market at the moment. So they backed him into a corner, which meant the only way he could leave is if he went on strike and refused to play for the club. And he's obviously never going to do that, right? Barcelona were the team that essentially, you know, um, brought him over from Argentina, paid for his medical bills and essentially made them, allowed them to platform to become the superstar that he is now at the moment so you know if anything he owes them um the he owes them the gratitude of leaving without that much fuss but he's put put into a corner where he's essentially having to play his contract at Barcelona for another season and then decide where he wants to go next season the same thing for Paul Pope in a similar way just because of the market he's being priced out the level of Paul Pope as a player the fact that he won the World Cup with France the fact that everyone knows what he's done prior to you at Juve the fact that Man United are a mess so people can generally say hey you can even though he's 27 and he should be showing more at the moment than he is showing uh on a consistent basis if he does play blah, you know whatever exceptions that exist there are people that out there that can easily say we could easily count Man United out because it's a mess right look at what Mino's doing at Tottenham look at how he you know didn't really work well at United there's obviously something going on with the club all together that's sort of affecting these stellar names so he could definitely attribute himself to that but unfortunately there just doesn't seem to be a market out there for him like a club willing to pay the transfer fee that he's obviously going to command so he's sort of letting a weird position right if he carries on if he carries on playing that way he's been playing in the last two or three games he's obviously going to um court the attention of some big cl- some big clubs because there's not a lot of players at Pogba that exist on the market that's the one thing he's got in his favor even though he might have not pulled up as much trees people want him to there's still not a lot of players with his sort of profile the closest thing to him at the moment on the world market is maybe a Kamavinga who hasn't really proven anything you know and you know on a big level for a consistent period of time because he's young and he's like 19 or something but there's not a lot of those players that exist right tall athletic um mobile-ish two-footed midfielders who can play in various positions they don't really exist in that regard um there's obviously that kid at ix um so there's not a lot of them so he's got that in his favor but also the price range like who's going to pay for him so i guess that's mineral's way of saying that hey i know i spoke i probably spoke too soon because no one's going to come in for him in january it's just not going to happen january there's not a lot of business that happens anyway because the better clubs don't want to let go of their better players because they're usually in the latter stages of cup competitions or title or league challenges right the last thing they want to do is you know um sell their talisman or their you know uh rock center back or whatever or their you know majestic goalkeeper they don't want to do that um next quote from mineral is the following Pogba will have a great future. In England, they were very sensitive when he talked about Pogba. I've just expressed my thoughts. I've said that Pogba can leave in the summer. It's hard to do top deals in January. Now, the other thing they mentioned, I think, is that supposedly Pogba behind the scenes isn't happy with Raiola, not because of what he says, but because he's 
um, inability to get a deal done for him to go to his next club. He feels as if Mignarola could have done a bit more to secure his signature to another club or force the club into position where they have to kind of let him go. But I guess, you know, smartly in United's case, because Pablo as well has been professional, he hasn't necessarily, you know, apart from the sulking on the training ground and not ap applying himself, he hasn't turned up late. He's not refusing to play. He always makes himself available. Um, so those things are obviously helping his case uh, are kind of, no, those things are obviously helping his situation, helping United more so because they get to obviously to hold on to him because he's not a bad influence in change room. But for himself, selfishly, he's not obviously being put in a position where he can move. So there is a feeling behind the scenes that probably isn't too happy about Raiola's um, ineffectiveness of getting him a move, especially when he's been so vocal about leaving. So let's see what happens, man. Again, um, I think as a fan, I would much prefer if he just comes out and says, hey, I'm willing to give this another year and then I want to leave. Just openly, plainly just says it. I think that would be fine i think football memories are short i think everyone forgot about that original interview that he did in china so people don't really know what his actual thoughts are obviously he doesn't owe the fans he doesn't owe the fans act somewhat because the whole reason why you have an agent is so they can speak on your behalf um especially to the club so maybe that's if if minerado says what he says we have to just take it as Pablo's word but it would be nice to hear that from him just say categorically look this club is great so it's, it's always going to be in my heart i love it all my heart i'm a true professional i'm never going to not apply myself but i do see myself in another place with another challenge but for the time being I'm going to apply myself in the same way that Ronaldo did right when he went to leave and Sarah Ferguson told him hey just give us another year right we end up winning the Champions League I think that year before he left in it so if he can do that or something along those kind of lines I think he would definitely do go a long way to sort of I wouldn't say mending relationship with some fans because I think some fans just have it out for him regardless because he's young flashy and potentially black that might be an issue but in general i think for the football fans in general it'd be nice to see that happening and kind of that chapter close to some certain extent but hey that's all we can hope for next on the list here what else do we have uh, unfortunately for fellow londoners um yeah for fellow yeah for fellow londoners most of you are probably aware that we've now moved into tier three um over the last what couple of weeks or so i guess cases have been surging with people um naturally deciding or to go outside and mingle and hang around with each other shops have been packed central london's been heaving with human beings uh trapezing all over the place so it was no surprise really um i guess the only funny thing about it is that if you actually look at the list of restrictions there's not much difference between a tier two and tier three except for i think the non-sitting inside of a restaurant or a pub so you can still go to one but you have to get a takeaway that's the only difference really and then i guess in that respect what the government is sort of doing without actually saying it out loud is that they're trying to prevent people from just hanging around in groups that don't pertain to the people that they actually live with and I just wish, in my opinion, I wish they were just more honest about that because the hospitality industry is on their knees, right? They, they, you know, so many casualties um, during COVID, especially with the open, op you know, with the lockdown and reopens and the lockdown and reopens and the tears. It's just creating so much misery and pain for a lot of people out there, especially with the lack of support from the government. And it's understandable, right? I don't think the government should be put in a position where they have to sort of support each and every um, restaurant, bar and chain, you know, a huge sector of hospitality industry in the UK to sort of look after completely but from what I've read online most places or the industry at large are more than happy to kind of earn their own keep they don't want the handouts they want the ability to try to make some sort of income during these difficult times and if they're given the you know the space the remit to sort of be COVID secure and open to a limited capacity they'd be more than happy to do so right but they don't want to do that but instead they want to keep locking down you know huge sectors of the economy and then refusing to explain exactly why they're doing it in a scientific fashion right it doesn't really seem like if you would skin depending on the stuff that you read the stuff that i've read so far says that the transmission rates in bars and restaurants isn't as high as you'd expect i think it said overall it contributes to maybe three percent of case five percent sorry of cases between that five to ten percent of cases which is insignificant considering the amount of cases that happen in schools right and they have remained open for the entirety i think of covid right um and i don't really know why that is why don't they just come out and say honestly 
that hey the reason why we're just doing this is so we don't want you guys hanging around that side there's no scientific evidence behind or the scientific evidence that does exist is dubious and there's no conclusive dec- you know conclusion from it but we're just doing this so we limit people from just standing or hanging around in pubs and frolicking or whatever it may be um instead of just doing this whole like fake um you know assertion that they're somehow trying to protect us all by closing the bars and pubs when actually the bars and pubs are probably the safest places to be because they go out of their way to make sure they're covid secure but hey what can we do this is um news from bbc london BBC News story said London move into tier three as infections rise. It says um, London will move into England's highest tier of COVID restrictions from midnight on Wednesday. Parts of Essex and parts of Hertfordshire will also enter into the same time. A new variant of the coronavirus has been identified, which may be associated with the fastest spread in Southeast England, Ms. Hancock told Commons, which is interesting. I'm not sure how true that is. I think that's just a ruse to get us all to stay indoors. But hey, supposedly we have a new variant of COVID that happens to only exist in the south and somehow magically will go and pause for the five days across christmas sure okay anyway parts of restaurants and tier three must close except for takeaway and delivery also under the rules sports fans cannot attend events and stadiums and indoor entertainment venues such as bowling alley cinemas um uh, must remain shut now the interesting part about that right is that this weekend actually i think this weekend i think i might have seen it here let me see if i can get up on my thing this weekend right because I guess, as you're aware, in tier three, you can go to, sorry, in tier two, you can go to indoor events with up to, I think, a thousand people, wherever the half of your capacity is. And I guess this or this weekend just gone, a lot of venues are sort of like using that as an excuse to put on some nights, right? Some DJs are playing in some places, some semi plaguey raves are happening out and about, but you know, it is what it is. But the funny thing about it is that they've never really ever allowed or given any indication that nightclubs will be allowed to open, right? Nightclubs specifically with any kind of limited capacity during COVID, right? It's just never been entertained. The assumption is, oh, you can't be in a nightclub. That's the worst place to be. Um, transmission rates are high. Lack of, you know, air conditioning. Um, some of the places don't have good ventilation. Blah, 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 blah. Right? That's, that's what they've been telling us. Did you know that this weekend, right? This weekend just coming, there was going to be um, the World Darts Championship was going to take place at Ali Pali, Alexandra Palace in London. In indoors, they were going to have a World Darts Championship take place, an event with actual, you know, high ranking darts players playing to an audience full of lager outs. If you've ever seen any footage of people going to the darts, it's a very rowdy affair. It's not quiet. You can't put a quote unquote muzzle on the people that go to these sort of events. You can't police them to make sure they've all got their mask on because they're all going to have a massive, massive pine in their hands. So imagine the hypocrisy of that, that somehow the hospitality industry is at risk of spreading Corona when before this restrictions and lockdown, the Alexander Palace was going to be open. And it's going to be servicing darts fans from around the country. Because don't think it's only going to be London fans coming down. Darts is a very working man sport, right? It's a thing that you probably mostly get your first introduction to it playing in a pub or some sort. There were going to be loads of people from all over the country coming down to London to go see the darts. Especially on a one-off night, especially since they've all been indoors for the last year and a half or for the last year for the most part. Like, imagine that. Make that make sense. How does it make sense that darts is going to happen this weekend? But then they wouldn't allow you to open a nightclub with restricted with a restricted capacity. It doesn't make any sense, man. It's utterly, utterly maddening how they basically done this. Um, it continues here. Uh, la, 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 la. Health Secretary told MPs that action had to be taken immediately before the next scheduled review of England's tier three system on Wednesday to slow the sharp exponential rises in infections. Adding that in some areas the virus was doubling around every seven days. Of course. No surprise when you keep people indoors for a prolonged period of time, innit? Hospitals across England, um, Essex and Kent were already, sorry, London, Essex and Kent were already under pressure, he warned. He said that there was currently nothing to suggest that the new variant was more likely to cause serious diseases and advice was that it was highly unlikely that the mutation would fail to respond to a vaccine. But he urged vigilance and said everyone needs to take personal responsibility. Sorry. I love the whole vigilance thing. I love the whole like be alert thing, right? There's no real stern mandate to do certain things. It's all a suggestion. It's all like a quasi coercion of some sort. Especially, you'd think you'd think that wouldn't be the best place, 
best way to kind of get people to do what you want to do especially considering the amount of time we spend indoors right people have got you know lockdown fatigue and then you're gently suggesting that they do what you say to do it's like no i'm not, I'm not gonna listen to you um, anyway with kent midway midway and slough already under tier three rules it means larger parts of the southeast of england will soon join much of the midlands northeast uh, northwest and northeast of england under strict closures more than three, 34 million people will be in tier three when the changes come into effect and 21.5 million in tier two and about 700,000 in tier one the latest tier areas include great london of course all those areas are the what are the tier three rules the rules are no mixing indoors you can meet groups of six outdoors shops gyms and personal care like hairdressers are staying open pubs and bars of course closed but they're open for delivery which is always this is from the beginning this was always funny to me right because i remember the start when they told us you know, bars and pubs are the main cause of the spread. And I thought to myself, okay, if they're the main cause of the spread, why are people allowed to go in and order or go in and stand up or go in and sit down? It didn't make any sense, even with limit capacity. Then they took it away and said takeaway only. But people are still going in and standing around, especially at places around where I live, where they sort of have like a um, a door on that end, on this end, at both lead outside. Some places were using that as an opportunity to kind of have it seat standing only sort of thing so that was obviously having people indoors i guess you know with the breeze coming in and all that sort of stuff it helped but that never really made sense for me either you keep them open with limit capacity and covid secure um uh you know procedures put in place or you close them completely this kind of in-between thing is just strange um of course sports fans can't attend stadiums indoor attend event venues such as bowling as the cinemas must stay closed and people are advised to not travel to and from tier three areas so again you know the fun's been knocked out of of uh, of living for another brief period um but then suddenly it will all reopen again just before christmas because for some reason covid takes a break over the five days ago across christmas again makes no sense but hey we we there's very very little that we can do to influence all these sort of things um we just have to kind of you know uh grin and bear it for the most part grin and bloody bear it talking about covid um responses we have an interesting um sort of prediction here from bill gates um he was talking to I don't know what's his name is it Jake Tapper I don't know one of these nondescript white men on CNN and discussing basically when he thinks um the world would get back to some level of normality and he kind of echoes a lot of the things that I've spoken about in here obviously where I would think I would imagine you know regular schedule programming as in wherever you were doing this time you know December of 2019 would probably only start to happen you know again next year december 2021 or more likely than not middle of 2022 and he kind of echoes a lot of these thoughts here via this interview on cnn which i'm going to play for you now do, 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 do. Million people in california are right now under brand new stay-at-home orders uh, as hospitals there uh, risk being overwhelmed um, there are a lot of governors uh, who oppose bringing back these lockdown orders and forcing businesses to close. What do you think? Do you think more states need to consider taking that kind of drastic action and the kind of drastic action we saw when the pandemic first began? Or can there be a more nuanced approach? Well, certainly mask wearing uh, has essentially no downside. They're not expensive. Bars and restaurants in most of the country will be closed as we go into this wave. And I think, sadly, that's appropriate. Depending on how severe it is, the decision about schools is much more complicated because there, you know, the benefits are pretty high. The amount of transmission is not the same as in restaurants and bars. So, uh, you know, trade-offs will have to be made. But this, the next four to six months uh, really call on us uh, to, to do our best because we can see that this will end and you don't want you know, somebody you love to be the last to die of coronavirus. When do you think life will fully return to what we thought of as normal back in January? No masks, no social distancing, uh, no other protective measures necessary. Certainly by the summer, we'll be way closer to normal than we are now. But even through early 2022, unless we help other countries get rid of this disease and we get high vaccination rates in our country, the risk of reintroduction 
will be there. And of course, the global economy will be uh, slowed down, which hurts America economically in a pretty dramatic way. So we'll have, starting in the summer, about nine months where a few things like big public gatherings uh, will still be restricted. But the funny thing about these sort of predictions from people who obviously have the means to survive however long the world economy comes to a grinding halt is the ease at which they just say we should all just put our lives on pause until 2022, isn't it? That's the funny, interesting part of it. Number one, anyway, you know, asking Bill Gates what he thinks about a, vi you know, uh, a virus of this uh, magnitude makes no sense he has just about as much insight and learnings and knowledge as we do right obviously he is a very learned and intelligent man obviously a very successful person but to somehow um revert to what you know bill gates said because he gave a very predictive uh TED talk a few years back uh, predicted maybe that we won't have the infrastructure in place to deal with a global pandemic and it's obviously been proven right it is quite interesting that regard right that we sort of always sort of um, defer our authority or our guidance to people who generally have means greater than ours just because they have the means right somehow because he's able to amass wealth and to create these great companies that somehow that makes him have an opinion that is more valid than the ours, which it isn't of course just have an opinion like you and i but like i said it's just concerning that these people always have such disregard to or are so quick to say hey let's just close everything down um until things go back to normal it's like we can't do that though you know we can't right we have different countries such as australia and new zealand who have somehow been able to handle and limit the spread of covid whilst somehow you know, living the everyday life without the vaccine. And that's what we're gonna to need to do if we're going to ensure that the most at risk people, the people who are basically, you know, at the lower rungs of society are going to have some level, some sort of future to even look forward to, right? Because I think people who obviously occupy the higher echelons of wealth are gonna be always gonna be okay, right? You know, you know, you see, you know, you read reports of, you know, Jeff Bezos now, the founder of Amazon is now the richest man, you know, in the history of the world. Obviously, most of that wealth has been, you know, has sort of quadrupled or his net, you know, his, uh, his net worth has sort of, you know, got exponentially high since COVID. Um, so there's obviously some sectors, some people who have obviously benefited greatly from it. Supermarkets, I'm sure, for the most part, I'm sure Sainsbury's stock and Tesco stock has gone crazy high during this time. But for everybody else, we were just fighting for scraps, right? We were just sort of like waiting and hanging on as hard as much as we can, as long as we can, right? We're essentially in those sort of movies, right? Those cheesy 90s movies where the hero is sort of dangling on the side of a building on his fingertips, just hoping for a couple of more seconds, hoping a, a stranger's hand peers over the side and pulls him up, right? But if you're a rich person, you're in, you're in a helicopter. Somebody's pulling up in a helicopter beside you and telling you, handing a rope on to you so you can climb yourself in. You're perfectly fine. You probably don't even end up in a position where you have to fall off a building in the first place um so that's actually the issue at hand so as accurate as it is i just don't want to hear it coming from bill gates i really don't i think if anything um politicians local governors should be going without out of their way to make sure that they somehow reopen parts of the economy as safe as they can just so um there is some sort of ability for people to resume a normal way of living in some respects and more 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 important than not to be able to provide them for themselves because a lot of these places with the exception of maybe germany i think that's been really supportive of different sectors of the economy and providing funds and support and all this good stuff most countries are really resistant to offering up any you know any potential of supporting their citizens in a monetary value because they know they can't do it for a prolonged period of time because there's no guarantee or, you know, that COVID is going to be over in the next year. They can't do that. Um, and once you give people money, they're going to expect it forever. It's just what it is. I think it's human nature, right? When you get, I don't know what, maybe it's entitlement. I don't know, but I get the resistance to doing it. Fire. If you're resisting and you don't want to introduce or reintroduce socialism to your country and you want people to earn their own living, then allow them to go to work allow them to open their businesses up, allow them to travel, allow them to do everything that they need to do in a safe way so that they're not in a position where they need to ask you for something. But again, you know, we're just all subservient to the people in power and we're just sort of all waiting around, hoping things get better soon. But I don't want people listening to Bill Gates or I don't want governments listening to Bill Gates. You know what I mean? I'd rather they just you know make their own decision based on the information that they have to hand.
You'd hope so. You would hope so. What else do we have here to speak about? Let's move on. We got that. Oh, no, it's an independent article. Of course, so this is from, where is this from? This is from The Independent, I think, or YouTube. It's going to take a while to load up, I think, because I probably loaded up too many windows. But essentially, it's Angela Merkel pleading with um, the German population to adhere to the new strict um, hard lockdown rules that are coming into place, which have effectively... <laughs> which have effectively uh, put any sort of nail in the coffin about my idea of going to the Bergen anytime soon. Or if any of you guys who are thinking about going to Prince Charles or, you know, whatever else you're meant to be going to, um, in, the next few, in the next few months or so. And it's also made me really jealous about the people that are able to sneak out um, and pop over to the great city of Berlin over this summer. Because that's something I wish I ever would have done. I was a bit... We're bleiben oops, bei den persönlichen that. Kontakten yeah, dabei, yeah, yeah, dass uh, Freunde... Because, yeah, I was a bit on the, this is actually her talking in the background, but I was a little bit on the fence about doing it earlier. I didn't, I, I didn't want to be, oh um, my God, come on. Treffen können mit maxim I didn't want to be responsible for spreading anything. So I kind of was like, oh no, let me just abide by the rules, um, do what needs to be done, bloody blah, 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 blah. And now look, um, essentially, with, with the exception of a couple of countries in Europe, everyone's basically doing a pretty good bad job of handling COVID. And we're all sort of in a worse position than we were maybe in the summer, maybe sometimes far, far worse than we could have predicted. Um, and it doesn't seem like it's slowing down. If anything, what seems to be happening is that the longer people stay indoors, the more crazy they get and the more anxious they get to see people because we're obviously social creatures. We need to be around our friends and family and just strangers because I think a lot of the, I've mentioned before, a lot of the footage I saw of people hanging around central London in Soho, Oxford Street, all this sort of cool places, all these sort of, you know, commercial places. They were just all walking mindlessly around, right? Um, and they all had a smile on their faces. Watch the videos back. Everyone's smiling, everyone's laughing and joking, bubbling around you, but you don't really see that many shopping bags. So I think my assumption is that most of those people just wanted to feel alive again. So they just went to Central London just to go and hang around strangers just so they could, you know, feel the ambience and the vibrations of people all around them, the footsteps, the beeping of the minicabs and the black taxis and the smell of the buses going by you and the underground and all that stuff. That's what they actually needed. So inadvertently, the odd thing is for governments to basically tackle and to basically wrestle when it comes to policies and um, and what they basically, and methods and actions that they put in place to stop the spread of COVID is that the longer you keep people indoors, the more you ask them to stay indoors, the more restrictions you place on their movement, the more they'll be anxious and ready and willing to run outside and stay out for as long as possible and get up to as much debauchery as they can when eventually the economy reopens. So it's, it's basically serves within their best interest to keep stuff open to some extent so that people can not be as crazy as they are now because it's, it's equivalent to like that um, it's equivalent to the kind of common stereotype of like, you know, girls that go to Catholic schools, right? Where you're sort of restricted in what you can and cannot do in and around school. And in the moment you go to like a, you know, a college um, with no religious denomination, you just freak out with the freedoms that you're given or a person that lives in a strict household and then moves out. It's the same sort of kind of idea behind it. So um, they're really caught in a weird position lock down the economy too long keep people inside too long and then when they do go out they go absolutely nuts but unfortunately there's no going nuts for you guys if you're in germany unfortunately because this lockdown is going to be serious even more so than what they're doing here in london and again like i said earlier the prospect of going to Bergheim has been put way 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 back into the future or what has been pushed further and further away um you know in the future for me at the moment and i'm assuming for people living there to just you know moving around the country has also been been a bit of a challenge. So this is from Sky News. It says COVID-19 drove me to go back into lockdown over Christmas. Is to be plunged into a national lockdown over Christmas amid rising cases of coronavirus under new measures which will last um, from the 16th of December to the 10th of January. Schools and non-essential shops across the country will be closed. So that's the first time I've seen that, right? Most places they've definitely kept schools open, um, but I'm guessing, you know, they just don't want to take any chances of your transmission, which is what I said earlier. I don't think that Bill Gates idea that somehow schools have less transmission than uh, pubs and bars doesn't really make any sense. Um, most parents know that, you know, you read most 
most accounts of parents that you know you generally get sick a lot when you have kids because they tend to carry loads of germs and shit and interact with loads of people so if if a kid can pass um germs such as colds or flus which is another form of a virus to adults why can't they do it with covid it doesn't really measure up in that regard um continuing said bars and restaurants will also remain shut while the sale of fireworks will be banned ahead of new year's eve because you know new year's eve is that's the way i was really concerned i was really not concerned i was really i was interested to see what would happen because in the uk new year's eve is a big big um you know festive celebration in some respects right um a lot of people who generally don't go out who don't generally socialize at night tend to kind of make new year's eve the exception plus the caners plus the alcoholics so there's a whole bevy of uh people out there who probably shouldn't be intermingling with each other in the first place which causes the lions and the shit experiences and it's not necessarily the best but i can imagine this year more so with people always you know mostly been indoors they've gone there's going to be more need to kind of have a bit of escapism during this tough year so i was really interested to see how the governments would deal with it going forward because halloween wasn't dealt with that well there were many many party many many illegal parties happening in london um especially during halloween so i can only imagine what's going to be happening during new year's eve so i guess for germany they're sort of limiting it by to some extent by obviously closing all shops for a prolonged period of time from december 16th to the obviously the uh, early january which will put people in you know which will kind of get them used to the idea of not going out and then there won't be that need to go out on, on the new year's eve i guess in that regard and also the fireworks so people won't be outdoors just in the streets and stuff you know letting stuff go but i'm sure people are gonna be able to get hold of them you can just imagine the black market for fireworks is going to be booming hairdressers and salons and tattoo parlors also be closed the doors and drinking in public will be banned until the 10th of january which is mad um the number of people allowed to meet indoors will remain restricted to five or from two householders however germans are still allowed a small pre uh, reprieve over the christmas period which is odd again to do the in the uk up to 10 people will be allowed to meet from 23rd to the 1st of january the measures agreed between chancellor angela merkel and the leaders um of the country's 16 federal states building restrictions already in place under the partial lockdown she's um and this is her talking about it here let's play a bit of her speaking Let's go back here. So. Mal fünf Personen und Pers wir bleiben bei den persönlichen Kontakten dabei. Dass, so we, we were, which, this is what then it says here. She said we remain that friends, relatives, and acquaintances can meet with a maximum of five people in two households. Können mit maximal fünf Personen und zwei Hausständen. And there is exception only of a Christmas holidays from the 24th to the 26th of December, which makes sense, and, but not on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. This exception means that you can invite four more people beyond your own household. We will close retail stores on Wednesday, 16th of December, and keep them open only for food and similar urgent goods of daily use. And ähnliche dringende Waren des täglichen Bedarfs. Care will also be taken not to expand the sale of non-food products in food, food retail. And there will be a ban on the sale of pyrotechnics before New Year's Eve. So, so proper, 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 proper hard lockdown coming up. More so even than the UK. And I, and I think, I don't know if I'm right, but I think the numbers here are worse than they are in Germany. So again... It's all really bizarre, man. Who knows what's actually going on and how they're dealing with it. And maybe it would help if we were... Would it matter if we were in the EU still that we'd have some sort of joint effort into how we sort of combat COVID? Maybe that might be the case. Um, who knows, really? But again, uh, praise up for all my German uh, viewers. Um, it's going to be a hard, hard winter and probably New Year for you guys. But again, maybe these really strict restrictions will help you on the other side. And again, the vaccine's obviously been approved, so that might obviously ease things going forward. But it's definitely looking like a cold, lonely winter and New Year for most of us in the european union what else do we have here what else do we have here what else do we have here um but, 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 let's move on actually from the covid talk let's go into something a little bit more fun 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 ba, 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 ba. dramatic photo here the planet nope german shop in cleveland Da, da, da. yeah let's go here let's go first let's just carry on speaking somewhat about the whole um yeah let's let's maybe yeah let's move to this one so 
obviously, as you guys are aware, um, there's been an ongoing uh, battle. Yeah, there's been an ongoing battle here on the scene in general. I think most of you are aware between Danny Wang and Peggy Goo in a very public uh, spat they've been having where essentially Danny Wang is declaring war on Peggy Goo now that she's left the building that they used to share in Berlin. And he essentially exposed all her bad behavior behind the scenes and how much a bad neighbor she was and how bad she was for the community or the industry in general and just essentially putting mud on her name right it's a it's, it's a pretty embarrassing affair on his regard to most part because it does it does it, it does kind of feel like there's a tinge of jealousy involved in some of the arguments put out there but for unfortunately with all these sort of issues it's, it's less about the issue between the two people and more so about the reaction online the reaction online has been pretty disappointing to be honest especially for the people that have essentially been um taking the opportunity to um question I guess her validity in the scene, the Peggy Goo, right? Um, the question of position, question of success, um, a lot of, I wouldn't, oh, I, somewhat misogynistic comments, a lot of brain dead comments, are just comments that you just think to yourself, hmm, I wonder if some of this is just an excuse. I wonder if they actually have a problem with the lady in question or they're just using it as an excuse to kick her while she's down, which, you know, is generally par of course for the stuff that goes on social, right? You see a lot, right? When somebody's getting pelters online, it's very rare that, the, that there's a group, a uh, majority group of people who band around to sort of support them and sort of protect them from the abuse. It's usually people who just want to see stuff burn, who want to see people crumble, who want to see people, you know, delete their accounts and all this sort of stuff going out and potentially kicking them while they're down just so they can kind of pile on the misery. That's what it usually is about, isn't it? But of course, um, the reaction again has been split people are on different ends of it people some people think hey daniel was in within his right to call her out you know it doesn't matter if she's a woman it's not a misogynistic thing it's just an issue that he's having with somebody that works in his scene in the industry a fellow professional who he wants to call out in public in order to basically put light to her bad attitude um and then on the peggy goose side of things is um essentially the uh obviously the blatant misogynist the miso the blatant misogyny that some people feel is there that maybe is reflective of the scene in general and also the disregard for what's that word called they call them is it ableism right something where you're essentially saying stuff about somebody and then you're also opening the doors for other people to say very uh, to say worse things about the person does that make sense worse or to say bad things i don't know regardless what that term is you know we know what i mean so um annabelle ross who's been covering a lot of the more um unsavory uh things concerning dance music has put together uh, an article here on medium um essentially giving her opinion on what has been going on and it's pretty interesting to hear her side of things and to see how she basically views it as somebody who kind of covers dance music and the people that are involved in it you know on the on a journalistic point of view so i'll read a bit i highlight some sections that i want to basically talk about but the title of it is the goo the bad and the ugly what peggy goo for says about the electronic music pandemic of misogyny which obviously you can find on medium and i'll put the link um at the bottom as well whilst you guys are if you're watching it now but i'll read it through the bits of highlight and we can kind of go on from there so um one bit here i've highlighted it says the following da, 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 zoom in a bit there boom it says um danny wang's facebook post um this week describing his elation at the fact that peggy had moved out of his berlin apartment building and the online response to it was further study uh was a further uh, of it was a further study in the ingrained misogyny today eleven thousand people have liked wang's um laundry list of goose crime spanning her excessive makeup and perfume um expensive designer clothes and hundreds of pairs of shoes her alleged ghost producing her kleptomania and a mental illness um playing play graves planning to donate large sums of money to the club whose part owner produces her merch her obsession with instagram and lots more danny wang has five fifty five thousand facebook friends and seven hundred and five thousand followers on the platform um again the ingrained misogyny thing i don't really think i agree with just because of the I, I can't count i'm not going to go back and count it but i do remember when the whole eric Mueller story came out it was quite concerning to see it quite a lot of women who are fans of him coming out and supporting him and saying hey um the stories you know the, the stories from the accusers are bullshit questioning her their motives and essentially just excusing everything that was coming out about eric Mulo. um you didn't see that you didn't see that so much with uh, derek may don't get me wrong but i did see a lot of women coming out supporting eric Mulo. i don't think it's a i don't think it's a gendered thing i think it's more so a reflection of society there's just 
a prevalence or there's just not prevalence i think there's a uh there's something about us where if somebody has some sort of um position some sort of clout some sort of reverence notoriety wealth position power whatever it may be in a particular scene in a particular industry especially the, the more niche it is the worse i'd imagine i'd imagine the cases of like abuse in communities such as like magic the card gathering or something like that would be really high right i think the smaller the niche is um the more elated the people in positions are in power right they're sort of like way up here to the people that are down there and they could usually get away with murder so i think it happens in all scenes in my opinion and if that's the case and i don't think it's a misogyny thing, i just think it's a scene it's a toxic scene thing because some of the responses are so again on the, the eric Mueller stuff were coming from men and women all over the world right some people who i'm sure had family members that were victims of abuse who were excusing everything he was doing so that was odd continuing by comparison the article posted over at the uh over the past months or so on facebook by mix mike um 1.9 million facebook followers resident advisor six half a million facebook followers DJ Mag, 3.5 million followers about the decade spanning sexual assaults by the hugely successful DJ Eric Miller and Derek May, um, as told by multiple victims, have received no more than 500 likes each, which is understandable, right? No one wants to. I think now, especially now, because of the so, because it's such a been such a shit year, I, I don't think people are not engaging with that content or with those reports or with those exposés because they don't care. I think it's just because you know the last thing people want is to be, uh, you know, subjecting themselves to that level of negative not say negativity you don't you just don't want to hear more bad news right you're already having a bit of a shitty year as it is globally we're all having a bad one i just think that's the case and i think this is just such a nonsense story it's such a frivolous argument that people just want to see it's car crash tv and it? it's kind of the equivalent of an argument you'd see on love island so it's, it's no you know i'm sure the love island arguments get a lot more traction than the story about prince andrew supposedly being a nonce do you know what i mean i think that's the same sort of example it continues the fact that wang's post received 22 times as many likes as a sexual assault story speaks volumes about what people and mostly men see as the most pressing threat in the industry not the ongoing abuse of fans of women but the unfair success of one again i don't think necessarily think that's true i think no one likes unf no, no one likes yeah that we don't I think society in general just yeah no one actually likes somebody that doesn't appear to have success that they deserve no one likes cheaters. It's just something that's ingrained in us, right? You go to someone's house and you play a board game and someone's cheating, regardless if you're just mucking around, it's not cool, right? You, you're going to be you, you're, you're gonna be in a bit of a mood. You might get in an argument. It might even get physical. No one likes cheaters. So if, if, if anyone can feel like somebody's being inauthentic or not being true or the story is somehow a lie, it can necessarily, it can really damage that person and it also can change the perception of them um, greatly, which is why a lot of you know celebrities and public figures go out of their way to correct stories that they feel are going to be, paint them in a way that's going to paint them out to be dishonest in some regard, right? They kind of, you know, which is probably why t Trump came up with the term fake news. You don't want people to think that you're a liar. Um, you don't want people to think that you misrepresented yourself you want people to somehow um side with your version of events which is why people go out of their way to correct those sort of stories so i don't think i think that's the case in that regard and again i just think people i don't think again i don't think it's a men and women thing i just think industry wise as a scene there is a real big problem with dealing with issues you look at stuff that happened with race right look at stuff that happened with the school the school had a really really like bad case of what looks like um discrimination at the door accounts from people who you know span race different racial backgrounds sexual orientations coming forward and saying hey this club is toxic the bouncers are you know saying some wild shit at the door you know um putting people in really awkward and bad situations abuse is happening and it's all handled, happening under the watch supposedly of the management of that club and you know they just completely ignored it they sort of gaslighted it in some respects and then in the end instead of dealing with it head on it just closed the club right <laughs> so i think as a scene that was a really good example of just how bad we deal with things in general forget men and women forget whatever i just think anything that goes outside of people playing music at clubs we just have no real way of actually dealing with it as a collective um and I, again i just don't know what it is like but there's definitely an issue there regarding it um but i just don't think it's gendered it continues i don't necessarily think that wang is a misogynist but the language in the post certainly is as well as being ableist and the fact that he was allowed um, and even encouraged 
uh, so much uh, flagrant sexism and misogyny in responses to his diatribe severely undermines his argument that he is an ally for women. Hold on, so read that again. And the fact that he has allowed and encouraged so much flagrant sexism and misogyny. Okay, so that's a bit I have a problem too. I think there's obviously a reply there from Vakula. And I think I mentioned before, if Vakula's on your side, you know, that's probably, you probably know you maybe need to back out in it. It's sort of the equivalent of like, you know, someone like a Cernovich retweeting something that you post on Twitter. You don't really want that. Or like a Milo Yiannopoulos, isn't it? It's just that those sort of like toxic individuals are probably not a good represent, are probably not a good um, co-signers for your argument. So when he sort of just, he, when he didn't sort of uh, pull yeah when he's when he didn't call out Vakula when he basically started off his sentence by saying that he smashed Peggy Goo and that's why he knows that she's this and that that was when he sort of lost me I was like okay this guy's on a mad one he's willing to sort of indulge Vakula in his um blatant disregard for these women and what they've done in the scene just so he can further cement or kind of valid validate his argument that's obviously not cool but the ableism thing I'm not really sure about because I tried to look that up right and again from what I, from what I saw online it does say that ableist language mostly pertains to people with disabilities right it says ableist language is a language that um, is offensive to people with disability it can also refer to language that is derogatory abusive negative about disability ableism is the systemic exclusion of oppression of people with disability often expressed and reinforced through language so I don't see how that's ableist because no one in this conversation is disabled from what I know physically anyway. Um, maybe it's more of a sentence regarding, maybe it's more of a phrase used to like say, oh, you are, you're basically, she's basically enabling creeps to come out and, you know, uh, discriminate or, you know, throw mud against women in general. I don't know. Maybe that's the case. But if you guys know what that term is and I'm reading it wrong, because I didn't understand what the being ableist meant when no one's actually disabled. But anyway, we, we continue. Um, there seems to be a several other accounts supporting the idea that Gu has been unpleasant and even abusive. You would hope that such behavior would lead to people deciding not to work with her, which would diminish her power in the industry as word of her poor character spread. Not true. Of course, as we know, Eric May, um, Derek May, sorry, Eric Murillo, loads of other people be in the scene too who have basically gotten away with murder because they occupy a certain level in the scene and also to be completely honest i think the scene has a lot to blame as well for peggy Goo's apparent big-headedness right she does she thinks that shit doesn't stink because the scene enabled it right the scene basically propped her up chucked all loads of money at her gave her all the opportunities under the sun um you know selected her as the next big superstar and now they're all surprised that she's somehow acting out and being a diva you know you made your bed you've got to lay in it it continues her performances at playgraves especially considering her wealth and a dodgy planned donation from jägermaster for whom gao um, gu was a brand ambassador to, to sub club um whose part owner um, usman kushi was 100 percent owner of the girls merch company were rightly criticized mate just imagine right if um sven var did that if richie horton richie horton's already have a little bit of a bad reputation with some of his um brand deals that he's sort of associated with just imagine if a story came out richie horton did what peggy did with the Eager Master. bloody hell so there, there is some level of there is some level of difference when it comes to reporting issues between men and women in the scene but by and large you know the people the higher up they go the more uh, unscrupulous they are really d regardless of gender it just is what it is i guess i don't know why but i think you know sometimes in this scene money begets more dickedness it continues but this story is much bigger than peggy Goo. bad behavior mistreatment of people or fake talent it's about the language used in the post the palpable the palpable glee sorry of uh, the mostly male respondents as they sought to tear her down and the fact that so many of them are chomping at the bit to attack Goo, but won't say a word about the industry's worst kept secret the rampant abuse of women agree with that one i think that's been the most concerning part of it again fair enough she might be a bitch she might be you know annoying she might be a bit entitled spoiled and whatever she is but still the level of energy people are putting towards tearing her down um i don't see the same amount of energy being brought towards the stories concerning eric miller and derek may and especially considering that they're not even like this the concerning thing for me i'm not going to mention other names but there's far more popular techie housey you know um ambient melodic house djs that exist deep house djs that exist right um so you think to yourself if people are willing to defend and excuse the behavior of eric merlot and derek may imagine what they would say about god forbid a seth truxler right um a tale of us um 
some people from the inner visions imagine like if they're willing to die on the Derek May, Eric Miller Hill imagine what they do for those kind of guys that's a concerning part of it so again yes is she a bad person is she a unpleasant person to hang around with quite possibly but come on let's put things in perspective a little bit mate let's put things in perspective a little bit continues wang has sought to defend himself against um, some of the distractors but his post especially the original one uh, before criticism caused him to edit to do some edits i didn't know about that was equally as troubling as guzla malfiance i tried my best he says here to, to be nice to her ignoring the outfits <laughs> of escada mixed with supreme on top of tommy hilfiger anything with a pricey label he's such a cunt in it the bad makeup and the overpowering perfume red alerts for mental illness hello um he wrote he later said that he was merely uh painting a picture of her hysteronic personality disorder where we are yet to see a diagnosis from a psychiatrist of course but it came across as a petty assault of her appearance scent and clothes he shared the anecdote about her alleged theft of an eames chair while acknowledging that it might be the result of a mental health disorder he reported that an old friend said that he could that he could tell her he could tell me who really produced her releases going on to say i haven't verified that then takes a shot at her djing via bergheim booker who supposedly told him peggy goo was nothing like what we expected we will all certainly never book her again again it's your fault why is bergheim booking the dj that just started playing in 2017 your problem um everyone sort of again i, I really dislike this era. everyone was a friend when it was cool but now that this guy said this stuff all of a sudden she's the enemy of the scene it's all nonsense you enabled it you encouraged it and now that someone's speaking out you're suddenly having the courage to stand behind him and again you're standing behind him and the abuse that she's getting online it's not on now part of me also thinks i think about a little bit like like i think i never was posted something else so she's my exchange with daniel wang i think to myself like is he mentally ill? Does he have like an actual issue that he's actually suffering from? Or is he going through an episode that we don't know about behind the scenes? Maybe. Or I was actually thinking to myself, you know what? This is actually quite a, um, he's actually alienated himself somewhat from the industry. Because if you think about it, none of the big platforms like RA, DJ Mag or Mix Mag have posted anything about this whole ordeal or argument. None of them, right? They're all putting their head in the sand because essentially they've all got deals in place with the agencies that she's signed to. Is it Liaison Arts, whatever it's called, right? Of agencies she's with that represents mad different people. It's got everyone from DJ High to Gerd Janssen to loads of other people on that label. If even people like Taylor Us are on there, right? So there's a lot of, they have a lot of connections in the scene. So they're obviously avoiding upsetting anybody. So they haven't covered it. RA Mix Mag DJ Mag. So if you're if you're Danny Wang, you're probably doing you're probably doing the worst thing possible for your career by saying this about Peggy because she's got a lot more. Even though he's been in the scene for like what twenty five plus years in the industry, she seems to have a lot more influence behind the scenes than he does. Even though she's only been professionally DJing since two thousand seventeen or whatever it may be. So again, maybe it's meant. Maybe he's actually going through a mental episode, or maybe he's just willing to just burn the ships right he doesn't really care he's gonna burn every bridge that he can because he doesn't see any way out of the situation he's in at the moment i don't know but that got me thinking continuing one of her shocking offenses while working in a record store in berlin was to take a picture of herself among the record bins and upload them on instagram wang was a particularly outraged by good contributes to a late mike huckabee and andrew everall in which he was saying how much they admired her as a dj that's mentally ill first of all it's a massive stretch to assign her comments to mental illness secondly if you read Goose post sorry she says um many kind things about both men uh, before expressing how much um their support meant to her she says back in 2015 her caption says um um, he said he liked my voice and asked me to speak on my life with um, The Wave Love Volume 2. This is a privilege that will stay with me forever. She wrote of Mike Huckabee. Of Andrew Everall, she said he also complimented on one of my mixes that was only a few years ago, but it meant so much to me and encouraged me to be um, to an extent I will never forget. I don't detect any mental illness in these words. Of course not. Um, again, RIP Andrew Everall, um, you know, gone way, way, way too soon. One of the many tragedies of this year, definitely a legend in London. Um, but there is something kind of weird about somebody paying tribute to somebody that passed and also inserting their own personal anecdote in there. Um, I think back to a post 
um, that young Dolph did when Nipsey Hussle passed away. Do you remember that? When Nipsey Hussle passed away due to, you know, an unfortunate shooting outside of his um, store. Um, young Dolph made some weird pose where he was essentially standing on a car, some Lamborghini truck or something. And he said like, oh, uh, rest in peace, Nipsey or something. And it was, and he was like, you know, he was in like some yellow Lamborghini with a matching outfit and all these jewels on and shit. And it was just like, what are you doing? Are you praising Nipsey or are you taking the opportunity to show off your fit? and your level of wealth it's just so bizarre that sort of thing. and people do that often it's, it's a kind of a unfortunate consequence of social media where people sort of kind of put them you know you see a lot when people are sharing tragic stories right someone sharing a tragic story about something you know really really bad that they went through in their life and how they've kind of seen you know they've kind of um been able to uh get on get on the other side of it and then somebody in the comments will share their really tragic story so they can kind of gain sympathy they can kind of draw sympathy away from the post that's above them it's very very bizarre I don't i don't really it's kind of equivalent to turning up to somebody's wedding you know and sort of like out trying to outdo the bride or the groom like it's their special day relax and take a seat so i think that was a bit odd but again i wouldn't it's you know put it to mental illness or just put it to being a representation of the times we're living at the moment and then another one said da, 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 da. It's a quote from Wang who said something like, "Yes, I've yeah." This is the concerning bit again about Wang how he approached stuff. This is a, his his response to the whole um, Derek May stories that came out. Right, he says, "Yes, I've read about and spoken with women who were assaulted by Derek May, but I have no personal contact or experience with him, so I support the victims. But I cannot speak to them based on what I've heard. I would guess that he is a true predator. I feel disgusted by the predators as you are. Let justice be served. Smiley face. And yet, when the news surfaced about Murillo and May and their many victims." Wang felt no such compulsion to share his disgust on Facebook or Instagram profile. That probably that says a lot more about who he is as a person, but also I would kind of give him a bit of benefit of doubt, a bit of a bly, just because he went through a personal experience with Peggy. However frivolous it is, he's obviously going to have a lot more to say about that than he is about something that happened that doesn't have nothing to do with him. But it is quite, you know, you have to give him a bit of a side eye to be like, how can you write 75 you know, paragraphs about a 27-year-old DJ right but you can't say something about people that you've probably interacted with in some way along the way you know in your industry and they're kind of decade you know years of abuse that's a bit odd but you know what can you do another quote so to the responses of artists i respect including detroit born techno producer dj alan oldman which is another disappointing one someone i was delighted to interview earlier this year i've been bothered by his reaction to the derrick may allegations ranging from silence to support his longtime friend of may and the comments that he supported on wang's post were deeply disturbing he laughed at a guy who said i'd still hit that <laughs> of goo and that another guy who said classic minimal bitch i admired both wang and oldman as djs and producers until this week now with as many as men with, with as so many men in the scene who have revealed ugly sides of their character this year i just feel disappointed in them <sighs> the alan oldman thing is oh, is is a hard one isn't it because they're actually friends and i think the friend stuff is odd like i said before about eric Murillo, i do think it's bad taste for people to post eulogies about him when he passed especially considering the severity of the allegations and the um charges being brought against him I think there's a way to do it in a very tasteful and tactful way if you're actually friends with him. But like I maintain, I think a lot of the people that are posting tributes to him weren't actually his friends. They were just doing it to cloud chase. They wanted people to know that they were friends. People, if you remember, a lot of people were posting, you know, old black and white images or pictures from like point and shoots from back in the day in Ibiza so that people could know, oh, look, he was Eric Willow's friends back in the 90s, back in the 80s. So they can kind of show off who they kind of knew. And a lot of the pictures, I think some of the people as well, you saw pictures of him with other people. It wasn't only them to it was always be like another celebrity in the picture as well so it was kind of a bit of a clout thing but i think if you're actually his friend you owed him just a private acknowledgement a private remember like you don't need to tell the world that you're missing your friend and you're sad that he passed away so soon you you'd easily reach out to the family you could support them anyway kind of in any way there needs to be i'm sure there was a private funeral or wake held in his remembrance but I think the eulogization and then the excusing of his behavior by saying that he had demons was gr disgusting to the extreme. And um, I think if you're a victim of uh, that sort of abuse, seeing those sort of posts from people that you probably work with or people that you probably respect must have been really distressing for everybody involved in it. So I think that's hard. But again, when you're his friend, friend, I think you owe him a private, you know, acknowledgement of it, but you don't need to be putting that publicly, especially not in that manner. Um, again, I, I, the laughing and the, 
sort of like weird comments that he made at the bottom here again i just think it's a symptom of the scene i just think there's so many ugly parts of the scene that have been revealed during covid that are essentially um showing us that some of the people that we sort of exalt or put on a pedestal maybe we shouldn't we should maybe listen to these people's mixes maybe see them playing places but we shouldn't be ascribing any sort of um moral correctness or decent behavior in any way shape or form we shouldn't we just we enjoy their artistry in whatever form that they bring it to us and if we can separate the art and the artist you do that but to kind of accept them in totality is going to be very difficult especially considering some of the stuff they got up to this year i can definitely agree with that one and then the last quote here but Wang's claims that he has done um, nothing to be jealous of don't quite ring true. Gu probably made more money in one year than he did in 20 years of touring. He's certainly respected as an artist, but he may never receive a fraction of Gu's fame or fortune. Is that unfair? Maybe. Um, but what uh, Wang has incited makes him uh, no better than what he's accusing Gu of. His post and his response to it has simply reminded us yet again of how rampant misogyny is not seen. Again, I don't think that's true. I don't think it's a misogyny thing. I just think it's a shitty scene thing, toxic to the extreme. And the lack of self-policing is also hurting it. I remember, it's a bad example, but I think skateboarding is probably the best example I can make analogy, right? When I first got into it, right? Skateboarding always had this weird thing, especially when you go to the shops, it always kind of vibe you out. Right, it always sort of like haze you in a little bit to kind of ensure that you were there for the right reasons. And then once you got in, you were in, right? And you kind of had this global connection with people, with kids and people all over the world, right? It was this one thing that you could kind of be connected with. You bring a board to a local skate, sport, a local skate park, a local spot, and you instantly become friends with people that cover, you know, all different parts of the globe, all different races, all different sexual orientations, all that, all that good stuff, isn't it? Um, but a lot of the reason why I think skateboarding didn't suffer, didn't kind of uh, suffer the same fate as like rollerblading, I think for the most part was that self-policing in the beginning, that sort of really boys clubby sort of attitude, right? Even in the beginning, girls weren't really treated that well in skateboarding either. But now you see loads of pro skateboarding girls, crews, uh, videos being put out, you know, sponsorships. Like it's just a thing. No one really bats an eyelid anymore. And um, even the fact that, you know, before you'd be called when, you know, if you were somebody like myself and you were skateboarding, you'd be called a white boy. Now there's loads of kids that are, you know, no, loads of non-white kids out there and adults who are deciding to go out there and skateboard. It's become just a, um, probably the only true subculture really and to some level to some extent and a lot of the reasons was because of that really tight-knit community in the beginning that sort of made sure they kept the outsiders out um but i think in electronic music especially in dance music scene the moment the money started coming in from the big corporate brands it immediately diluted whatever we had and it invited some very unscrupulous characters it encouraged some very um in it, you know some very questionable actions and directions which is why we end up in a situation where we're in now where essentially somebody like a peggy who's only been playing since 2017 is somehow out earning somebody like a daniel wang who's been in this industry for 25 plus years so to say that it's not unfair it definitely is unfair don't get me wrong but life is right it, life is unfair but it definitely is unfair and you can definitely understand why somebody of daniel wang's position would feel a little bit aggrieved by it but again, I think it's a symptom of the scene. We essentially made this that way. We fucked it up. We are the ones that sort of left it to its own devices and allowed people in that shouldn't be in. Like I think back to the beginning of the of the of the lockdown when the Disc Woman Collective were trying to um, crowdfund uh, donations in order to support their artists because a lot of them had gigs cancelled. I think this might have been early before COVID, before lockdowns actually came into place, maybe March or something, February. Um, this woman put out like a fundraiser post somewhere, right? And they got so much stick for it. The comments were horrible um, about them trying to raise funds for you know support, obviously the people on their label and stuff. And you think to you and you feel yourself like, then a few months later passes by and you have all these big DJs going out, putting out posts and Kickstarters and funds together to support tour managers. And then look at the response to this. It's just like, there is something about the scene in general that doesn't support the, in the people involved who are actually doing the great work, who are uplifting marginalized voices, who are, you know, supporting the local community, local scene in a meaningful way. It just doesn't happen. And I don't know what it is. Um, again, I think we've, we've let in way too many unscrupulous characters from the outside. But I think, again, we are to blame for a lot of the things that are happening now at the scene. We are definitely to blame as a collective. We can't just point fingers and attribute it to one person because I think that's completely unfair. But again who knows how this is going to end this is the article there 
to end there regarding the good the bad and the ugly with peggy goo uh Fora says about electronic music's pandemic of misogyny written by annabelle ross again i'll put it in the show notes for you guys to check out yourself but it's a really good article regardless um some really cool points made i disagree with a few of them here and there but um it'll be interesting to see what happens next year does this actually change anything <laughs> will this allow different people to play in different places or oh, we just continue as we were prior i think nothing will change personally because human nature mate human bloody nature okay moving on from that one what else do we have here da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. what else do we have here oh let's talk about this in it right da, da, da. Yes, so we have. I'm again. I'm not. I'm not really familiar with Little Mix. I never listened to anything that they put out. It's not really something that I'd be, you know, looking at me. You'd imagine I'm not really the biggest Little Mix fan, but I have been keeping an eye out from a distance regarding this whole affair with one of the members called Jesse Nelson, who seems to be the. Um, who seems to bear the brunt of a lot of the online abuse, and who definitely hasn't necessarily coped with fame the same way that maybe her other bandmates have. And unfortunately now is her news has come out officially from her, her side that she decided to leave Little Mix permanently and focus on other things. And it's obviously some consequence um, to some of the abuse that she's been suffering online. Because I always see her kind of fronting, you know, cyberbullying campaigns or, you know, there'll be some sort of uh, post, well, no, the, the, there'll always be some sort of program that she's basically part of where they're sort of talking about the danger of social media. And it always seemed a little bit, you know, I won't say superfluous, but I didn't really take too much attention to it. But for somebody of her level, of her stature, because I think, you know, Little Mix have been around since what? They're, they're nearly a decade in the industry, right? They're an established act. Um, they have a very loyal following for the most part. No, I don't, again, never listen to any of their tunes, but I'm assuming people love to love what they do, especially if you've been around for that long. So it's not like she's leaving a fledgling band that isn't doing that great she's leaving a really great situation because you just simply cannot handle it day to day and um it definitely says a lot about you know the perils of social media and just the dangers of uh people this age growing up you know being growing up in public and also growing up in public famous to this level it just must be so hard to deal with so this is jesse nelson officially leaves little mix courtesy of yahoo news so jesse nelson has left little mix after nine years of the x factor winning oh shit i didn't know they were an x factor group that's even more impressive uh, the 21 nine year old released a statement saying the pressure of being in the girl band had impacted their mental health while explaining her decision to part ways um after thanking the fans of support and describing her years at little mix as the most incredible time in her life nelson went on to say the truth is recently being in a band has really taken a toll so this is a, a statement here via instagram it says to my mixes so so to all my mixes the past nine year little mix has been the most incredible time of my life we have achieved things i've never thought possible from winning our first brit award to our sold out shows at the o2 making friends and fans all over the world i can't thank you all enough for the bottom of my heart for making me feel like the luckiest girl in the world you have always been there to support and encourage me and i'll always never forget it the truth is recently being in a band has really taken a toll on my mental health i find the constant pressure of being in a girl band um living up to expectations very hard that comes at a time in my life when we need to reinvest in taking care of ourselves rather than focusing on making other people happy and I feel like now is the time to begin that process after much consideration and with a heavy heart I'm announcing I'm leaving Little Mix I need to spend some time with people I love doing things that make me happy and I'm ready to embark on a new chapter of my life I'm not sure what that's going to look like right now but I hope you'll still be there to support me I says I want to say thank you to everyone involved in the journey all the hard work and dedication that went into making us a success to every single fan who came to see us in the concert who listened to our songs and sung their hearts out sending messages and supporting me along the way i want to know that i love you and all so much and i would never have done this without you um most of all i want to say thank you to jade perry leanne um for creating some of the most amazing memories i'll never forget i hope that you will continue to fulfill your dreams and keep making music that people love love jesse so again big 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 news in that regard so there was other bit of the article so obviously that's the girl here and she yeah she seems to get loads of abuse online mostly based on her looks um which i can just imagine what that you know 
women already have a little bit I, I guess in general young women find it difficult to navigate through social media there's a lot of um insecurities that get laid to bear on social um especially usually from other women who seem to be able to prick and prod and really garner reactions at women in a very um vicious way and it just seems to be a never-ending cycle in it you try to ignore them they find other ways to poke at you um you then try to ignore it and not react to it but then they see your reaction and they keep poking then you try and stand up for yourself and that doesn't go the way you need to go and you get slammed by the press it just seems to be a never-ending cycle and eventually it can sort of lead to you spinning out or to something more um you know uh something more extreme you know and you've obviously seen those cases of people eventually taking their life and doing what they need to be so if she decides to step away and do other things that's probably the safest route at this current moment da -da -da -da, we'll have a quote here uh shouldn't have little mix not anymore sorry there but yeah it came yeah so this thing last month there's no sudden denial she was taking an extended break from little mix for private medical reasons it came after she failed to appear alongside the band at a number of engagements and also went absent from live finale of the group's talent show um and from hosting the N mtv awards on september the 17th the foursome publicist said in a statement that jesse is having an extended time with little mix for private medical reasons obviously you can see them there um we'll be issuing the further comment um currently talks media to please respect our privacy earlier this year nelson's odd one out documentary won the best factual prize at the national television award bbc documentary focused on cyberbullying and nelson had been subject to any effects on her mental health like people are vicious online in it vicious vicious i'd never really understood that whole thing anyway in it like if you don't like something don't you just like not pay attention to it like the last thing i'd want to be doing is talking about stuff i don't like or engaging with any way shape or form because that's eventually going to lead to more eyes and more attention and the engagement's going to go up and it's going to be in my face even more so so it's like for the people that hate her she's announcing her you know her retirement or her ending of her sort of pop star career in the band and look how much attention that she's kind of garnered online it's the trending topic everywhere people are talking about all over social media so all that hate people put towards it hasn't necessarily worked has it it's if anything it's, sort of, it's it's only boosted her signal and allowed her to have an even more bigger platform and the ability to impact uh people to a greater level by you know sort of dedicating her life to combating cyber bullying or whatever it may be uh it continues here. Little Mix released their sixth album called Confetti in November. The band also slated to embark on a UK tour next April after initially postponing due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, the group was formed the next factor in 2011 after four originally auditioned the solo artists where the group were to win a competition. Yeah, man. Horrible, horrible stuff, man. The cyberbullying is, again, uh, I can only imagine what it must be like dealing with social media at that sort of age with that level of fame, being a woman as well, a young woman, you know, growing into yourself. Um, it's just, it must be a complete shit show. But again, if she's happy in this way, I think that's the best option for everybody involved in that one. What else do we have here? Yeah, I think that might be, yeah, and I think we're at 135. Yes, end there, 135. We're going to end it right there. Again. It's the Excellent Zinger Show, episode number 411, 411, right? Yep, thanks again for tuning in. If it's your first time checking out the show, make sure you smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review and a share and a download would help spread the word. So please do that if you can. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Peace.